Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the informal service. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Lord, as we turn to you this morning, help us to pay attention to our thoughts, help us to pay attention to the ways that we understand your truth and the ways that we use your truth. Help us to use your truth to change ourselves and to love others. Help us pay attention to the times when we might use your truth to love ourselves and change others. Help us get back to the true way of understanding your truth, which is the loving way, which is the way that brings you into our hearts and you into this world. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. So this coming Wednesday is June 19th, and that is uh, both the holiday Juneteenth, which is a very important holiday to celebrate, but it's also the birthday of the new church. Um, And when I say that, I'm not talking about any specific church organization like the Lord's New Church or the General Church talking about something that Swedenborg mentioned in his book, True Christianity, where he said that on June 19th, 1770, that was a very significant moment spiritually for the world. Uh, It's the beginning of a new way of doing church, a new way of, of experiencing spirituality and a new way of seeing and understanding the Lord in our lives. And so we want to try to be part of that. We want to try to be part of that new church movement. And so we celebrate every June 19th, uh, wanting that to be part of what we are and who we are. So the book of Revelation has a lot of symbolic imagery describing what this new church or this new spirituality can be for the world. And so we tend to focus a lot on the book of Revelation around this time of year. Two Sundays ago, I was preaching about the first chapter in Revelation, Revelation 1, where John had these visions. Uh, Evan, can you put up the the slides, the first slide? So we talked that Sunday about John the disciple. He was the last living disciple and how he was on the Isle of Patmos. And can you go to the next slide? how he had these visions. He started having these spiritual visions uh, where he saw the Lord. You can go to the next one. The first one, he saw this image of the Lord in the lampstands. And we talked that Sunday about how all of that strange kind of imagery is symbolic of who the Lord is. The Lord is divine love and divine wisdom. Can you go to the next slide? And there's this kind of intimate moment where John falls down before the Lord and the Lord reaches out and touches him. You can go to the next slide. And I like to imagine that he lifted him to his feet and gave him a big hug because this was a kind of a reunion between John and the Lord who knew each other on earth. And, and it's also a wonderful picture of remembering that the Lord is a person, someone that we can know and love and who loves us deeply. You can go to the next slide. So after that, in the book of Revelation, Revelation chapters two and three, it describes John writing these letters to seven of the early Christian churches in Asia, dictated by the Lord, these messages from the Lord to these churches. Can you go to the next slide? 
Oop, it's blank. Maybe go to the next. Yeah, oh, go back a couple. We missed a couple there. Oh, interesting. They're blank? Okay, well then go forward to the next one. I don't know why those were blank. John saw this next vision in Revelation 4 of this throne room, the Lord on a throne in this throne room uh, with these strange creatures all around. Can you go to the next slide? That one's blank too. Interesting. Um, and in this throne room in Revelation 5, he sees this image of the Lord holding this scroll. Uh, the scroll sealed with seven seals, and then go to the next one. And there was this upset that people were feeling. Is anyone able to open this scroll? And fortunately, we hear that the Lamb is able to open this scroll. I talked about the Lamb of God last Sunday at the traditional service. Um, and so what happens next, go to the next slide, is that the, the Lord, the Lamb, they're the same person, starts to open these scrolls. Uh, and that's the story that we're going to focus on today. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. You can go to the next slide. Yeah. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. And another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Amen. Thank you. You can turn that off now. So once again, strange imagery in the book of Revelation. What, what does this mean? We're going to be focusing today on the horses, what the horses mean. The Third Testament tells us that a horse is a symbol for our understanding, the understanding of truth. Why do you think a horse might be a good symbol for the understanding of truth? Why do you think that might be? Any ideas? It takes us places. It takes us places, yeah. Our understanding, you know, the way we see the world, that's kind of what carries us through the world, our understanding. It, it takes us to different places. We understand different things, and it takes us there. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, very strong, helps us to do important work. Yep, that's what our understanding does. Any other ones? Yeah, it, or it can seem more, more powerful than the will. I think the will ultimately is probably the more powerful, but it, there's a strength, there's an important strength to the understanding. Yeah, yes. Right, uh, at the time, biblical times, horses were used for important things, and that symbolizes, you know, we use our, our understanding every single day. And you could think about the times when people used horses every single day. I also like to think, yes. Yeah. 
Yep, horses are very intelligent, so that's another one. Another way I like to think about this is when I think about my own thoughts, I often feel like my thoughts are just galloping along, just running at full speed, and that's the way our, our understanding can be. It can be like a horse that's, that's running. So the Third Testament has uh, interesting things to say about this. This is from the book, The White Horse. Horses are often mentioned in the prophetic books of the word, but until now, no one has been aware that a horse means understanding, and its rider means someone who is in intelligent. A horse means understanding because of the way things are represented in the spiritual world. People there often see horses, and people sitting on horses, and also chariots, and everyone there knows that they mean matters of understanding and refer to a body of teaching. I've often seen that when people are using, people there were using their understanding to think, they appeared as if they were riding horses. That's how their thought process has presented itself to others, even though they themselves were unaware of it. I like that idea that you, you watch someone who's thinking deeply and it looks spiritually like they're riding on a horse. So today, we're focusing on these, these four horsemen in the book of Revelation, and it's describing four different ways that we can understand the Lord's truth. And as you can probably guess, three of them are not so good. These are understandings that are not very helpful, maybe even hurtful. And so we want to try to be aware of the different horses that we might be riding when we're thinking about things, when we're using the Lord's truth. That's, I think, what this story is about. All right, uh, Evan, can you put the slides back up? And then go, let's see, to the next one, or go forward, actually, not backwards. Keep going. <laughs> Get a nice view of these, all the horses again. Keep going forward. And the next one. Next one. And the next one. All right, here we are. We're going to start with talking about the white horse. The white horse, this is, this is what it says in Apocalypse Revealed about the white horse. A horse symbolizes an understanding of the word, and a white horse a deeper understanding of the word. Now, this isn't just talking about being smarter. This is talking about a deepness, like a kind of a wisdom, uh, getting what life is really all about, the, the deepness of life. And this is kind of clarified in what happens next, what, what comes next in this description. It says, he went out conquering and to conquer. This symbolizes people who overcome in spiritual battles. So it's not talking about an understanding of truth that is going out and conquering other people. It's talking about an understanding of truth that is conquering ourselves, conquering in our spiritual battles, conquering our own bad habits. That's what riding the white horse is all about, using the truth to focus on how do I become a better person, conquering those bad habits. I like the fact that it mentions that he has a bow. This is what it says about the bow. The bow symbolizes a doctrine of truth and goodness from the word, fighting against evils and falsities, or against false beliefs and bad behaviors, our own false beliefs and our own bad behaviors. It's interesting when you think about the, the difference between a bow and a sword as a weapon. A sword is something where you need to get up very close to your enemy to use a sword. Whereas a bow is something where you can, you can keep your distance from your enemy and still be fighting against that enemy. And I like to think about how the Lord had this sword coming out of his mouth. The Lord is the one that has the power to actually get up close to the hells and not be just totally overwhelmed by them. He has that power. We don't. We don't have that power to get that close to the hells. So the Lord gives us weapons, though, to still fight against them inside of us, but weapons that keep us at a safer distance. The Lord doesn't want us to be overcome 
by the power of the hells. And so we have a bow, a weapon to keep us at a distance from the hells, but still to fight against them. I love that, that symbolism. So let's think of an example of this. Here we've got the golden rule. This is a truth from the Lord's word that we can understand. And I think riding on the white horse is where I might look at this, this truth and say, okay, treat other people the way I would like to be treated. I'm noticing that I have a bad habit of being critical, overly critical, even judgmental of other people. Here's a truth from the word that's trying to put me in other people's shoes. And I can think, oh, I don't like being criticized. I certainly don't like being judged. So I should not do that to other people. So this truth, if I'm riding the white horse, is helping me see my own bad habits, that I'm too critical. I need to be less critical. I'm going to conquer that. That's riding the white horse. All right, next slide. Then we have the red horse, the fiery red horse. Can you think of another character in the stories in Revelation that's fiery red? The red dragon, the great red dragon. I like to think of these two characters as like spiritual siblings because it's a very similar idea with the red horse. Let me read a little bit about this. <clears throat> a fiery red Oh, a fiery red horse symbolizes an understanding of the word extinguished as to goodness, extinguished as to love. So this is like those times when we use the truth in a way that is not loving, that is maybe even hurtful. It says that this horse, this rider was given power to take peace from the earth. And that's what happens when we use the truth in a way that is not loving, that takes peace from the earth. That's what can happen when we have that kind of understanding. So let's think of an example of this. Here we've got the Lord's truth again, golden rule. I'm gonna to try to use this truth. It says, do unto others as you would like have them do unto you. So I can see that person over there is not living by the golden rule. <laughs> they are being a very, very bad person. And I'm using the Lord's truth to see that that they are a bad person for not following the golden rule. That's when we're riding the red horse. We are using the truth in a way that's not conquering our own bad habits, but trying to conquer other people's bad habits. And it's not actually, that's not how it works. That's not how conquering bad habits works. I love the fact that this horseman has a sword, not a bow, but a sword. And you can imagine that this horseman turned to the Lord and said, and saw that sword coming out of the Lord's mouth and said, I'll take that. I'm going to use that. The Lord has the power to judge people. We don't. But when we're on the red horse, we take that from the Lord and say, I can judge you. I'm going to fight against your bad habits. That's when we're on the red horse. And we're using the truth in ways that judge other people that end up hurting other people. All right, next slide. The black horse. This is what it says about the black horse. This symbolizes an understanding of the word extinguished as to truth. So the red horse was one extinguished as to goodness. This is an understanding extinguished as to truth. So think about that color there. We often think of light as being a symbol for the truth. So darkness is when there's no truth. So this is a dark horse, no light. Think about uh, a time when you maybe wake up in the middle of the night and you notice that the power has gone out and you just can't see a thing, but you have to get up and do something. And so you're stumbling around in the dark and you end up stubbing your toe on something and it's very frustrating and it's a little scary even that you can't see anything. We can sometimes have an understanding of the Lord's truth that's like that, where we are looking through the word, maybe even especially the book of Revelation, and saying, ah, I just don't get it. I don't see what this is meant to be about. It doesn't make any sense. And it might be as frustrating as getting up in the middle of the night and not seeing anything and stubbing our toe. 
stubbing my toe on the word. I, I don't understand what this is supposed to be about. That's riding the, the black horse. One of the things it says about this is he had scales, not scales in the sense of a dragon, but like a scale that to weigh things. Uh, and it says the scale in the hand symbolizes a valuation of good and truth. Wheat and barley symbolize good and truth. And a denarius, think of a denarius being like the equivalent of a penny, a very small coin symbolizes a value so little as to be scarcely anything. So we can have times when we're on the black horse where we're reading something in the word and we just don't get it. And the thought comes to mind, maybe, maybe there's no value to this. I don't understand how this is supposed to help me. Maybe it can't. Maybe there's no value. I think that very often a lot of people in sort of the younger generations in the world right now are riding the black horse because they're looking at the word and they're, they're maybe wanting to be good people. I want to be a good person. I just don't see how the word is helping me do that because it's so confusing and it's all about battles and strange imagery. How is that going to help me be a good person? It's interesting that very often I think religious people often end up on the red horse and non-religious people often end up on the black horse. I don't get it and maybe there's no value to it. That's the scales. Now, fortunately, it says, do not, and do not harm the oil and the wine. The oil and the wine is at the core of the word. There's that divine love and divine wisdom. And even when we don't understand what the word is saying, that love and wisdom is still protected. Do not harm the oil and the wine. It's still there for whenever we end up understanding it. So then we have the pale horse. Can you go to the next slide? The pale horse. This is what it says about the pale horse. So I looked and behold a pale horse. This symbolizes an understanding of the word destroyed as to both goodness and truth. Paleness symbolizes a lack of vitality. Doctrine is not seen without a life in accordance with it. The reality of this is not known by one who is acquainted with truths of doctrine and yet does not live by them. And people of that character appear pale in the spiritual world, like people without life. There's this great phrase in the book, The Doctrine of Life, all religion has relation to life and the life of religion is to do good. There's, there's life in the word, but we can get to a point where our understanding of the word is like the pale horse where we're not seeing any life in it. It's as if we, we've been on the red horse, we've been on the, white, uh, the black horse, we've gotten to the point where we say, I don't see how the word is helping me be a better person. And you know what? Maybe there's no point. Maybe I should stop caring. Just gonna give up on, on everything, on the truth, but also on uh, trying to be a good person. Thank you. I did actually do that on purpose. <laughs> gonna give up on, on understanding it, but also on trying to be a good person because maybe it's just really all about me. Just look out for number one, who cares about other people? That's when we're on the pale horse. We've given up on spiritual life itself. Are you thoroughly depressed yet? <laughs> That's where we're supposed to be at this point. This, we can all end up on all of these horses at various times. And so it's just good to be aware that we can do that. We can end up on any one of these horses. Now, don't get too depressed because the story's not over. We're gonna come back to the white horse and end with something good. So now we're going to skip ahead several chapters in the book of Revelation to Revelation chapter 19, where we see a return of the white horse. So Evan, can you put up the next slide? There we go. For some reason, unfortunately, I had these beautiful pictures from Nancy of the white horse, and I don't know why they're not showing up. But please go check out Nancy's beautiful painting of the white horse. But here's another one. 
So here's the story of the white horse in Revelation 19. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will shepherd them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Thank you. You can take that down. So here we have another image of the Lord. And you can, you can see that there's some similarities between the one that we talked about two weeks ago, the Lord in the lampstands. There's still the, the eyes that were like a flame of fire. There's still that sword coming out of his mouth. But there's some new imagery. This is the Lord on a horse now, a white horse. And he has this robe, a very kind of striking, startling image of a robe that's dipped or stained with blood. So what does all of this mean? What is that describing? One of the first things that always catches me in this story that I find fascinating is that it says he had a name that no one knew except himself. And then it goes on to give four names <laughs> for the Lord. Faithful and true, word of God, king of kings, lord of lords. So that's kind of an interesting dichotomy. A name no one knew, and here's, some, here's four names for this person that no one knew the name of. This is describing the image of the Lord, the, the divine human in the word. And so that's why one of those names is the word of God. I want to read a little bit about what this says in the Third Testament. This is from the book, The White Horse. His having a name written that no one knew except himself means that what the word is like in its inner meaning is seen by no one except him and those who he reveals it to. So we can think about that idea that at, at the core of the word is divine truth itself. And nobody really, no, no finite person can ever really understand divine truth itself. But the Lord wants us to understand as much of it as possible. And so he gives us these different names for himself, describing the different qualities in the word. So it's sort of both are true. We can't really know divine truth itself. We can't really know that name, but we can get a sense of what the Lord is like, what the word is like. And once again, there are these uh, dualities, these pairs that are describing the Lord as goodness and truth. Faithful and true, he judges and makes war. He had something written on his robe and on his thigh. He was king, he was Lord, all of those dualities are describing the fact that he is divine love and divine wisdom. That is who God is. So let's talk a little bit about this robe stained in blood. This is very striking, maybe even a little bit disturbing to think of the Lord that way. But if you think about the idea that this is an image of the Lord as the word or in the word. So his robe is describing the literal sense of the word. And if you've ever read the word, there are a lot of bloody stories in the word, a lot of violence in that literal sense of the word. But it goes deeper than that. The, the Third Testament says that what that's describing is not just that there's violence in the word, but that there's been violence done to the word. Anytime you see someone using a, a statement from the word in a hateful way, in a way that is hurting somebody else, that's actually doing violence to the word. It's not, it's not destroying the Lord in the word, but that garment has had violence done to it. And that's 
That's a sad reality, and that's part of what is pictured there in that image of the Lord. Another one that's kind of striking is this image of treading the wine press. Uh, can you put that slide up again, the, what, the last one that we had there, Evan? It says that he was treading the wine press. You can see that in that painting of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And this is another one that is maybe even a little disturbing. What does that mean? That's where that phrase, the grapes of wrath, comes from, is, is that description. And here's what it says about that in the Third Testament. This symbolically means that the examination was made in accordance with divine truths in the word to discover the character of the works that flowed from the Christian church's doctrine regarding faith, namely the, the doctrine of faith divorced from charity. So this is describing the fact that the Lord was coming in, in this sense of him coming, the second coming, the spiritual coming of the Lord, coming to examine how we've been doing as a church. You know, we've talked about how a vineyard is like the church. And he was treading through that and finding, instead of finding love there, he was finding fierceness and wrath. And wrath that appeared to be coming from God. That wasn't coming from him, but that was coming from the church, this fierceness and wrath. And so that's describing that, the, the Lord examining that and finding fierceness and wrath. So once again, this sort of warning to us to be, pay attention to how we are understanding things and how we are using the truth in ways that might not be so good. Thank you, you can take that picture down. So then we have the host of heaven. There are all these riders on white horses following the Lord. And I think the idea there is that we can be part of that, part of the host of heaven on, on white horses. I love this description here from, from the book, The White Horse. The armies in heaven that followed him on white horses mean the people who have an understanding of the deeper contents of the word. Once again, not just about being smarter, but getting the deepness at the heart of what the word is about. Their being clothed in fine linen, white and clean, means that these people have an awareness of truth that comes from doing good. An awareness of truth that comes from doing good. That's really where that deepest, wisest understanding of the truth comes from, is from actually doing good. And in order to do good, we have to address the bad habits that we have. So that comes back to that idea of being on the white horse is about looking at our own bad habits, trying to become better people, trying to bring that into the world. I very often will look out at the world and see everything that's wrong with the world and very easily hop on that red horse and go, you're doing it wrong and you're doing it wrong and you're doing it wrong. It's very easy to get on that. Other times I might look out at the world and be on the black horse, kind of like, uh, I don't understand what is going on in the world today. Or I might get on the pale horse and be like, I give up. There's no point. The Lord isn't here. There's craziness everywhere. But if I can remember that my job is to be on the white horse, is to be looking at myself and my bad habits and saying, I'm going to try to use the truth to change myself and love other people, when I can be on that horse, I can be part of those armies of the Lord that are making a difference in the world, slowly, gradually making the world a better place by changing it one person at a time for the better. So another wonderful thing about this is that it's not just that we can be part of those armies, but that that white horse, if we have that white horse in our understanding, we're riding on that white horse, that's carrying the Lord. That's carrying the Lord into our hearts and our minds, and it's carrying the Lord into the world. The more we can be on the white horse, the more the Lord can be carried into this world. It's an understanding that's not about fighting with other people, not about being right. It's not about uh, those battles that we so often get into. It's about having the humility to look inside and see our faults and try to be better. It's about loving, using the truth to love other people. When we can do those things, 
Not only does that carry the Lord into this world, but that helps to establish the new church, which is what this is all about. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen.